This is a talk through of how you might answer the church is apostolic. It's from section three on the Catholic paper, uh, Sources of Wisdom and Authority. So using the five point plan, your first task is to break down the question. So we're underlining the keywords church and apostolic. Add our definitions. Well, when we talk about the church, we're almost always talking about the Catholic community. Remember the difference is if you see it with a small C, it's talking about the building. Because it's got a big C here, it's talking about the community itself. And then apostolic, all that means is follows teaching of the apostles. So if we read word the question, what's it asking us? Now the tricky thing about this is, number one, how do we get from the apostles back in the day to today? So we need to show that link. How do we show this difference between Catholics and Christians? Because at Jesus' time, there wasn't a difference. There wasn't a, a difference between the Catholic Church and the Christian Church. And we, the other thing that we need to remember is this whole statement is from the Nicene Creed. And it's called the Four Marks. So in the Nicene Creed, it gives four characteristics, I guess, of what the Catholic Church should be. And that's one, holy, Catholic and apostolic. So if we break down the bullet points, what's it asking us for? So it's asking us for, what would a Catholic say? asking us would Christians differ and the answer to that spoiler alert is yes and then the final one is a conclusion so rather than do a plan straight away I'm going to just briefly go down to here and throw in some quotations that are going to match um, either side of the argument so if I think about what I can remember. The church is apostolic. We said the Nicene Creed says there's four marks of the church. Now, we could use that for a disagree. So the Nicene Creed says that the church is one, holy, Catholic and apostolic. And the reason we can use that as a disagree is because it doesn't say which one of those is more important. It says that they're all important. If we think about the apostles and our key quotations about the apostles, we should be able to remember the one about Peter. So in Matthew, there's a story where Jesus speaks to St. Peter and he says, he says this statement, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And by the idea of the rock, we're thinking of something that's unyielding, something that's hard, something that um, some of the characteristics that a good leader would need in order to be able to effectively start a new religion. Jesus also gives him two abilities. He gives him the ability to forgive sins and he gives him the keys basically to heaven. Now, we don't need to know those quotations off by heart, but they are part of this, they are part of this wider quotation. So that's quote number one. And quote number two, we are going to go for, go make disciples. And this quotation is so important it's got its own name and it's called the Great Commission. So we've got one, two, three quotations 
And just for balance, we'll put one in here about a different aspect of what the Nicene Creed says. So let's go for one. So we're going to go for, we were baptised by one spirit to form one body. So I've numbered these to make it easier when we do our plan at the top. Oh, knowing that it comes from the Nicene Creed, we can start to assume already a conclusion because this is isolated in one part of the four marks and it doesn't say in the Creed that any of these are more important. So actually our conclusion should be a partial agree but that it's an artificial distinction. And what we mean by that is, it is apostolic, but it's also one and holy and Catholic. So let's go back up here and do our little plan. So we first of all are going to say yes. It is apostolic because Jesus puts Peter in charge. And the correct term that we would use for that is authority. And then rather than writing it out again, I'm going to put the quote one. OK, so we've got quote one. Just put that there as, as a plan. Why is that important? So what have we got so far? Yes, because Jesus put St. Peter in charge. He has authority. He says, you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church. If you wanted to, you could there zoom the word rock. This means St. Peter and all the popes that follow speak with Jesus' authority. If you wanted to there, you could start talking about the Holy Spirit and Pentecost. Okay. You are going to then maybe say that this is a strong point because without it, Jesus' teachings would not have divided and changed. If we then go for a disagree, what I'd like to do here is talk about this idea of being like the apostles. So this is quite a controversial topic, but if we think about the behaviour So potentially the behaviour of some clergy does not match what the apostles would do. So we think about financial issues, so people taking money and using it in a bad way. Sexual abuse scandals. The apostles were Jesus' closest followers, and so therefore they would understand what he wanted them what he wanted for the world and perhaps today some of the behaviour of the clergy doesn't match what Jesus would want to happen. So I think we've probably got enough here to start drafting something out using this as the conclusion. So let's have a go. So if we were going to zoom this quote, this is how we would do it.
So, so far, we've got the church is described as apostolic in the four marks of the church in the Nicene Creed. This means it follows the teaching of the apostles whom Jesus gave authority. The Bible says that Jesus said, you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church. This means Peter is the basis for the Catholic community as by rock, this suggests something's hard and immovable, which the apostles would need to be to establish the religion. What we need to do now to make sure we can get to a band three answer is to evaluate the strength of this point. And it is a pretty strong point, um, especially because the whole purpose of Jesus's life was to share God's teaching. And for that to happen after he'd got, uh, resurrected and gone to heaven, ascended to heaven, um, he would need to find a method of making sure that news continued to be shared. So Apologies for the pen running out. And what I've written here, in case you can't read my writing, is this. This is a strong point, as before Jesus ascends to heaven, he gives the disciples a special role, the Great Commission, to go make disciples of all nations. Therefore, not only does Jesus give the disciples authority, and this is really for people who are going for a band three, we talked about authority up here, so it means you'd, tran you'd kind of put in that thread all the way through to here. He's giving them authority, but he's also giving them the role of making the church and making more followers, making the church apostolic. That is a pretty strong point. Going back to our plan, what we're now going to argue is the idea that if the church is apostolic, presumably all of the people that are part of the church should act like the apostles did. Because it's talking about the Catholic community and in particular the, the priests who are, I suppose, in charge of it. So let's go back to our essay. So, this is my point, it's quite a long one. However, if the church is apostolic, this should mean that those in charge should act as the apostles would have in their roles. Jesus told them to only rely on what the community gave them and not to have too many material possessions. So there's a bit in the Bible about how Jesus talks about just having one cloak and when you go to a village to help them, you should just accept whatever hospitality they give you rather than looking for more. So let's link that back to our point that we've planned here about the behaviour of some of the clergy today. I'm going to use the idea um, that we've been looking at recently in forms of expression about buildings too. We can, we can factor that in because we know when we look at some churches how excessive um, they appear to be.
So this might seem a bit strange that I'm including this here, but some bishops have been um, prosecuted because of child abuse. Now, the child abuse is happening locally by individual priests, and obviously the Pope and the Cardinals can't always have um, a lot of knowledge of what's going on locally, but the bishops do have much more knowledge. And some bishops chose, when those child abuse um, incidents were reported, to try and deal with it themselves rather than going down the criminal route, and which is wrong because it's illegal. And what you would find is some priests weren't properly punished for it, and now the bishops are in trouble for not having responded to that issue. And obviously it's a minority of people, but if the question is about the apostles, those people the priests themselves, but also the bishops who are in charge of those priests should have done something about it soon and made sure that it was looked into properly and prosecuted properly. So the point that we're making here is if the church is apostolic, then the church should act like the apostles would. And some people haven't done that. So we could talk about the highly decorated churches and all that money that could be going somewhere else. We could also talk about the individual behaviours of some people. Hope that makes sense. So do we need to say now if this is a strong point or a weak point? Let's have a think. So we'll put, given that this is a minority of priests who have done this, it could be said to be a weak point. However, the impact of the abuse on individuals is very serious and life-changing and not in line with what Jesus taught about serving the most vulnerable. You could also put there, if you wanted, about uh, the money issue and about how that money could have been spent. You know, you could put that down here too. Now, given that, if I just zoom out a little bit, given that we've now got two very very big paragraphs there's actually no point in us doing a massive amount more we can move straight to our conclusion here and if we go back to our plan we have covered this we haven't covered this we've used this we've used this we've used this so we're going to use something from here And I'm going to argue, as I said earlier, that in fact it is kind of to highlight apostolic is actually um, an artificial distinction between all of it. So let's have a let's have a start with that. And I'm going to use the word overall rather than in conclusion just to change things up.
So what I'm doing here is I'm basically saying it's an artificial distinction to highlight the apostolic nature of the church as the Nicene Creed lists them all as being of equal importance. These marks of the church were agreed at Nicaea, so in some ways they aren't debatable. And what I'm saying there is the bishops agreed it, so it's not really something that we can discuss. It's something that's already been set by the bishops. As you know, that's how ecumenical councils work. But what we could squeeze in here is other groups of Christians... We'll just say, for the sake of argument, um, Protestants, just as a general. And there's lots of types of Protestants, um, but we'll just stick with them for now. Just a little thing there, I prefer it if we didn't say we or I, um, I forgot that when I was writing it, so if you can say Catholics rather than we, um, you are taught a lot about Catholics, but it doesn't mean that everybody that's writing is Catholic, or the reader themselves is. Okay, so this last little bit here, however, Catholics... Catholics themselves would believe the church is apostolic, as without them we would have no Catholic church today, as who would have passed on what Jesus did and said that wasn't in the Bible? The Gospel of John said there would be no room for all the books if everything had been written down, so Catholics trust that those things were preserved by the apostles. So a really, really tricky question, um, and hopefully, hopefully something like this won't come up, but understanding the idea of the apostolic nature of the church is key and it is distinct from the rest of the Christian church. They do believe that it's one because we're all baptised in Jesus. They do believe that it's holy because the Christian church provides holy things that you can't get. I always say like you can't get baptised in McDonald's. The church provides certain things that are holy which you can't get anywhere else. The Catholic bit is open to everyone so if you believe in Jesus it, you can be part of the church so Catholic means universal rather than the idea of Catholic with a big C which is what we normally talk about but it's the apostolic bit that other Christians don't agree with because they think that you should just follow what's in the Bible because the Bible is um, you know firmly faithfully and without error the truth and um, they believe that it's actually God's word um, and so if it's not in the Bible it shouldn't be used Catholics and some Protestants as well so um, some of the Anglican Church of England Church would say that the Apostles teachings are also um, preserved there are slightly different things so you will know that when um, someone if you're telling a story about something that's happened to you and then you write it down the stuff that you say and the stuff that you write are going to be different in terms of how much detail is in there and the same thing is happening here with Jesus um, so this last little bit here 
there's a part of the Bible where John says that um, not everything that's in not everything that Jesus said and did is it actually end up in the Bible because there would be so much there that it would be impossible it would be impossible to include it all. So so we've relied on some things to be passed down by talking, um, and we still need those things. They're still important today. Very long answer, but I hope it helps.